big money power. Accidents don't just happen, and coincidence is only an excuse for the guilty. Welcome to the Conspiracy Chronicles. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwanted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. There has been an attempt, as perhaps you know now, on the life of President Kennedy. He was wounded in an automobile driving from Dallas Airport into downtown Dallas. The flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. Good evening. Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. Senator Robert Francis Kennedy died at 1.44 a.m. today, June 6, 1968. The incident that took place less than 15 minutes ago at the Washington Hilton Hotel when shots were fired at President Reagan. A second bomb has been found inside that federal building in Oklahoma City. The whole side has collapsed. The whole building has collapsed. The whole building has collapsed. The building has collapsed. The building has collapsed. That's the southern tower you're talking exactly, about. Exactly, the second building. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. Malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves, away from the guilty. And now, here are your conspiracy detectives, Joe Joseph and Tim Watts. Welcome, everybody, to the Sunday edition of the Freedom Link, our Conspiracy Chronicles broadcast here on the Orion Talk Radio Network. I'm Joe Joseph, along with Tim Watts, and tonight we tackle the conspiracy against Ron Paul. Hey, Timmy? This is going to be a good one. So it's something good on Sunday night. It's amazing how when you decide that you're going to go after a topic, you know, you start diving down the rabbit hole. Copyright Popeye 2008. And, uh, <laughs> and what, what happens is, is it just never stops. You kind of never hit bottom. And that's what happened with, um, with this research here is you just have no idea how unbelievably coerced, corrupted, uh, sidetracked, derailed, you want to call it, that the Ron Paul campaign actually got. It was bad. Mm -hmm. And you, you think, now here's here's my issue with it, Timmy, is the um, Ron Paul isn't exactly a spring chicken when it comes to this kind of stuff. He's very experienced. He knows what's going on. Uh, mm -hmm. He's run for office how many times? How does he let this happen? I, You know, it's a good question because that's exactly what I'm asking. You know, being a part of that 2008 campaign and looking across the aisle, you know, as Kucinich was getting screwed, we were watching Paul get screwed. You know, and it was happening to both candidates at the same time in 2008. So for him to go in this year and not expect this, I don't know. I just, I, I'm honestly speechless on this one. I don't know what to say because, again, you know, he already had 2008 to deal with. He, he knew what he was up against. And, you know, it, then you see him fold like a house of cards this time around. It's like, what? What's wrong here? That's right. Well, to discuss this tonight, um, we have a very, very, very smart, intelligent young man that's done a lot of research into this. He also has a YouTube channel. And if you go to YouTube, just search Educatorium Euphorium and you will find our guest, Dan. Dan, welcome to the show. Uh, you've done a lot of research into the Ron Paul campaign of 2012. And um, give me an overview of what your research kind of um, kind of showed you. And then we'll get into the specifics. Uh, hey, thanks, uh, Joe, and thanks, Tim, for having me on tonight. I think to kind of give an overview, what basically happened is the Republican Party establishment really realized how powerful Ron Paul's movement was. You know, the Campaign for Liberty, his PAC, 
his campaign. It's really been picking up steam and more and more people are starting to listen to his message. And so they realized that Ron Paul was trying to co-opt the Republican Party. And it seems that they decided that they needed to co-opt Ron Paul's campaign itself. They knew they couldn't really corrupt and take over Ron, but they thought that if they got his organization, you know, really under their umbrella, perhaps then they could kind of curb this movement for liberty. And basically what happened, it seems, is that there was a guy named Jesse Benton who was not really ever officially campaign manager, but he was chairman and he was kind of the de facto campaign manager. And what happened was the Republican Party establishment, mainly Mitch McConnell, they sent a man named Trig V. Olson to kind of pump up Jesse Benton, get him up through the ranks of Ron Paul, Inc., up to be his, you know, his right hand man. So then that way they could influence through the Ron Paul campaign the message of the liberty movement itself. Unbelievable. And but not unexpected, right, Timmy? No, absolutely not. You know, and that's the thing that, you know, catches me by surprise that, that they should have known this was coming, you know. And you know, the other thing is that uh, the people don't really catch on to that either, you know. They they're all so disgruntled about, you know, what's what's happened with Paul and they don't realize all the things behind the scenes. Man, you ain't kidding. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to start off tonight with a little uh, Politico ad, uh, or Politico piece, and that's uh, Ron Paul's campaign, Busy in August. Now, this was just written uh, on the 20th, three days ago. It says, Ron Paul's presidential hopes have long been over, but he's still spending cash like a candidate. Paul spent more than $588,000 in August to fund a range of activities and initiatives, from travel to consultants to maintaining a sizable staff. New federal financial disclosures show his presidential campaign ended august with more than two million dollars in reserve even taking in about one hundred and three thousand worth of contributions for the month his report indicates that stands in stark contrast to fellow gops uh also also rands newt gingrich and rick santorum both of whom continue to carry seven figure debt from their presidential runs hmm i wonder why that could be let's stop right there for a second and just say how does that happen right here you have Rick Santorum, who is supposedly, you know, kind of like the runner up, I guess you could say, in the um, the GOP presidential race. However, here's a guy, seven figure debt for his campaign. So what does that say to you, Dan, about the success of his campaign and more so the popularity? Well, I think it says that so many people believe in this message that they're really willing to actually, you know, pony up and give some money to it. I mean, this is a movement. These other candidates, they did stand for something, but they generally didn't stand for a message as clear and as unique as Ron's. I mean, Santorum clearly represented social conservatism and Gingrich kind of Republican establish, you know, establishment kind of values. Romney's just basically, you know, the same thing. But Paul had such a strong message and he his his personality, his kind of quirky, you know, unpolitician like personality inspired so many people that they were actually willing to take some of their hard earned money and give it to them. But I think what you just brought up kind of underlies something like that you had said earlier. How did Ron let this happen, especially because all this stuff is so out of you know touch with his values? I mean, Basically, it seems like the campaign, from what you just read, mm -hmm. has become like a bureaucracy, right? I mean, a bureaucracy, no matter if it's outlived its usefulness, no matter if it's actually serving the purposes it was created to serve, it wants to perpetuate itself. It wants to keep its members on the payroll. It wants to stay around as long as it can. It wants to perpetuate itself. And it seems like you know, Ron should see this because he, he understands this about government and that basically – his campaign has taken on many of the corrupt, you know, what should I say, corrupt characteristics, characteristics, right? characteristics of a, you know, an, an over centralized bureaucratic government. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. But uh, another mistake that I think um, that he made was hiring so many family members as mm -hmm. members of his campaign staff. Jesse yeah. Benton, of course, married to the daughter of Rand Paul. Valerie Pyatt, yeah. Yes, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as uh, the broadcast progresses, folks. But, um, you know, I, I want to differentiate things for just a second because, you know, you did bring up Newt Gingrich being the, 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 mainstream, um, the, the mainstream establishment candidate. And you're absolutely right. There's nobody more establishment than him. 
But what, what makes him stand out to me more than anything else is he came out on the record and pretty much said that's the way he was uh, in the 90s. Uh, at one point in time, he came out and said, for $500 million, I could buy every government form of local, state, and federal government in the United States. I could do it. And he started up a lobbying, lobbying organization, and he actually did it. They, they actually went and started funneling money to all these different governments and started taking them over one by one by one. Very interesting. Just research that a little bit, folks, because it really shows the true colors and intentions of these people. We'll be right back after these messages. Don't go away. You're listening to The Conspiracy Chronicles on the Orion Talk Radio Network. We'll be right back. Orion Talk Radio says, put your activism where your mouth is. Make a truth banner with a creative message to display in public. Make sure you mention Orion Talk Radio somewhere on the sign. Then take a picture of yourself and send it to us at oriontalkradio at gmail.com. We'll post your picture on our new activism page and show the world your message. So get the world out. Get the word out. Joe Joseph and Tim Watts here, along with our special guest, Dan, who on YouTube is Educatorium Euphorium. And we're having a discussion about the conspiracy against Ron Paul. Uh, very deep, very tangled web. And um, uh, what we're coming to find out is that, you know, his, his campaign has really turned into a big bureaucratic mess, as Dan stated. And, you know, a lot of the reasons for that is his propensity to put family members in. And I, I guess, guys, the, the thing that, that bothers me is that I guess he really can't trust his own family. I mean, look at how, um, look at how Randy Poo acted when, uh, when he broke ranks. And, uh, you know, got the, did the whole, uh, you know, mainstream acceptance, endorsing Romney. I mean, everybody says, well, that's a strategy. You had uh, Jack Hunter talking about how by doing this, he's making inroads and being able to, um, to uh, you know, be able to position himself for a 2016 run. My, my whole thing is the Ron Paul campaign was built on principle. And to do that, to ally yourself with the, quote, lesser of two evils, at the end of the day, Timmy, it's still evil, isn't it? Oh, Absolutely. You know, and there was only one horse in this race that was worth assault, you know, and they knew it. And there's many reasons why they wanted him out. I mean, Federal Reserve, number one, Constitution, number two, <laughs> because they don't want to go back to the Constitution. You know, it, it, he was just one of those candidates that they were going to fight tooth and nail to get out of there. But to see it come from inside, from the family, like you mentioned, that that is, you know, really unsettling. That's right. So while the other two mainstream candidates, Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum, both finished with seven-figure debts um, after they had pulled out of the race. Of course, Ron Paul, at the end of August, had more than a $2 million cash reserve in his campaign, even taking in $103,000 worth of contributions in August. And Paul never officially dropped out of the Republican presidential primary, only on August 28th, when delegates at the Republican National Convention enshrined Mitt Romney as their party nominee, did the Paul campaign officially cease. It ended with a loud, if ultimate, feudal bang, too, with Paul appearing at a rally in his honor and his delegates staging protests and walkouts at the convention itself. Paul received 190 votes by convention delegates to Romney's 2061. Among Paul's August expenditures, according to his filing, $48,474 for rental fees at the Republican convention, um, $25,000 in air charter expenses, about $21,000 for email services, and $15,000 for his sponsorship uh, for the Republican Party of Iowa. So, um, uh, you know, very interesting, the fact that he had such a cash reserve. And, and we start talking about family, how he had just a, a, a ton of family working in his campaign one of the major ones uh dan being jesse benton and uh jesse benton for all those that don't know again is the uh husband of ron paul's niece uh ran paul's daughter and boy i tell you what you put some you put your trust in these people and i guess ron being you hate to call him naive i i don't i don't want to call him naive but what do you call it 
I mean, the guy got bamboozled big time. And remember, too, Benton was on his 2008 campaign. What do you think, Dan? I mean, I don't know if he's as much naive. It almost seems, and I mean, I hate to say this because I've admired Ron Paul and he's always been someone with a lot of fight in him. But if you've seen some of his, you know, media interviews in the last couple months, he almost seems kind of tired. Oh, like, man, what like a, he, yeah, he seems mm-hmm. like he's he's almost like out of steam. Like he's he's put all he can into this. I mean, he's been in Congress for what, like eleven terms or something, and he's been he's been booed. He's had people hate him. He's had people like Mark Levin, you know, savage him and his friends. It's it's not like it can be an easy thing to be Ron Paul like in that position. So I mean, and he's an old guy, like you pointed out earlier. He's what seventy six or seventy seven. Yeah, he's he's getting old and tired. Yeah, that's it. You know, at 77 years old, can you deal with the rigors of a campaign? What, I mean, does it get any more dirty in, de- in, in politics than it does during the presidential campaigns? I, I'm sure it does, but, but being 77 years old and being just, ta- I mean, 30 years of consistency this man has had, um, speaking in Congress, going to college campuses nationwide, and speaking a consistent message while showcasing a consistent record, it's got to take it's got to take a, a lot a toll on you, not only on your health but on your mental faculties, to just be fighting this fight day after day after day, and continually running into brick walls. That's the only way I can think. You make steady progress, you know, educating the young people, but as soon as you go off and you try to to, to battle the beast head on, you just hit brick wall after brick wall after brick wall, just because of the fact that you really don't have any more men of honor in Washington. It's a shame. Dan, we were talking um, last week in my barber shop, uh, just getting a haircut, and we were talking about the lesser of two evils, voting for the lesser of two evils. Everybody's like, well, you have to go with Romney because why? He's the lesser of two evils. I'm like, no, you don't. See, because the lesser of two evils is still evil, and if you vote according to your values and your virtues, and if you are a man of honor, then you don't do that. You don't compromise your values just because this guy's the lesser of two evils. And what have we learned in history, Dan? I mean, have you looked back and at some of the prior elections where people have taken that stance? Has there been any difference between the Democrats and the Republicans, Dan? Well, no. I mean, um, People are starting to refer to them as like, you know, the Demopublicans or Republicrats or whatever because they don't see any difference. And that's one of my favorite people who who are really kind of, you know, political celebrity kind of person is Jesse Ventura. And he has been savage on both parties pointing out how they're really they're, – they're pretty much gangs. But behind, you know, all the violence and the fighting, there's no difference between them. They both are sticking up for the same interests. They both, you know, they both – really beholden to the government and to the corporations and to the Federal Reserve, there's really, you know, no significant difference between them. And it's sad that these kind of corrupt organizations were able, through Ron Paul's seeming nepotism, to get into the Liberty organizations. Well, one thing is for sure, <clears throat> and and Timmy, uh, back me up on this as far as this is, there really is no... Uh, I don't know how to say. Outside of Ron Paul, I really don't see. Maybe Gary Johnson. Maybe Gary Johnson. I mean, you have a guy there that's that's really had a track record of success being governor of New Mexico. Mm-hmm. But um, but as far as values and virtues are concerned, here he is running on a libertarian ticket, but he d- endorses state-sanctioned abortion. Mm, right. You know what and, I mean? Uh, yeah. Could I point something else out? By all means, Dan. I mean, I would if I could vote and I can't because I'm not of legal voting age yet, I would vote for Johnson over either of those two schmoes. But I think what's what's kind of what kind of would show and I mean would kind of prove that Ron Paul was in a way doomed from the beginning is that Ron Paul was running to the right of a libertarian candidate. He was more libertarian than the libertarian candidate, right? Right, exactly. I mean, if you look at his drug policy, his foreign policy, his monetary policy, that's he's much more libertarian than Johnson. And so, I mean, it, it's kind of, I guess it was a long shot in the first place to think that this, you know, ultra libertarian congressman from Texas could actually succeed in this very mainstream, you know, watered down moderate Republican Party. Well, let me point this out too. And then uh, I'm going to go to Tim on this. D- did you guys happen to see 
the um, the oh, better yet, let's let's do this on the other side of the break. When we come back, I'm going to talk about one way Ron Paul's influenced things to the point now where other countries are starting to implement his policies in experiments. So don't go away. We'll be right back after these messages. You're listening to Freedom Lee's Conspiracy Chronicles on the Orion Talk Radio Network. Don't go away. Orion Talk Radio is growing fast, and it's all thanks to you. With over 1.2 million people listening in just the last 30 days, people are now making Orion Talk Radio their choice for the truth. They know the corporate mainstream media machine has failed us miserably, so thank you to each and every one of you for listening to Orion Talk Radio, news and views beyond the mainstream media. Joe Joseph and Tim Watts, along with our good buddy Dan, Educatorium Euphorium on YouTube. The talk tonight is the conspiracy against Ron Paul. And let's talk for a second why. Why would there be such a push to derail Ron Paul's campaign? Well, let's look no farther than one of the organizations that were key to stomping him out, and that's Fox News, who's reporting that a uh, private city in Honduras will have minimal taxes and government. Hmm, sounds good. Small government and free market capitalism are about to get put to the test in Honduras, where the government has agreed to let an investment group build an experimental city with no taxes on income, capital gains, or sales. Proponents say the tiny, as yet, unnamed town <clears throat> will become a Central American beacon of job creation and investment by combining secure property rights with minimal government interference. Quote, once we provide a sound legal system within which to do business, the whole job creation machine, the miracle of capitalism, will get going, says Michael Strong, CEO of the MKG Group, which will build the city and set its laws, told foxnews.com. Strong says that the agreement with the Honduran government states that the only taxes will be on property. Quote, our goal is to be the most economically free entity on earth, Strong says. Honduran leadership hopes that the city will lead to an economic boom for the poverty-stricken country south of Mexico. The average income in Honduras is approximately $4,400 a year. Quote, it will bring a lot of investment into the country and be a center for many employment opportunities for our people, says Honduran, Pre Honduran President uh, Porfirio Lobo Sosa. The, law is, uh, the laws in the city will be separate from those in the rest of Honduras. Strong says the default law that will be enforced in the city will actually be based on Texas state law, which has relatively few regulations. Quote, it will be Texas law with more freedom of contract. Texas scores well on state economic freedom rankings, he explained. Texas law is also familiar to American business people, and it is very familiar to Honduras because a lot of Hondurans have gone there or have family there. Investors who think the city will do well will also be able to buy land there. There will be a free market in land, Strong said. The, ruling, uh, the rules for immigrating to the city have yet to be finalized but expected to be loose. It will be designed to be very welcoming to those a minimum threshold of skills or capital, Strong said. However, businesses in the city will be required to employ a minimum proportion of native Hondurans, a requirement imposed at the outset by the Honduran government to ensure the city's benefits largely go to Hondurans. To ensure the city against political change, the Honduran legislature has agreed that a two-thirds majority will be required to interfere with the city. MKG will invest $15 million to begin building basic infrastructure for the first model city near Puerto Castilla on the Caribbean coast, said Juan Hernandez, president of the Honduran Congress. The first city would create 5,000 jobs over the next six months and up to 200,000 jobs in the future, Hernandez said. And here's a very interesting thing, folks. This is happening in Honduras. It's not happening in the United States. You'd think, perhaps, that the United States would say, why? Let's have a little experiment where we put this to the test. Because, you know, here we have the United States. This is what we fought our for our independence for, you know, minimal taxes. We wanted minimal government intrusion. And now we have the exact opposite. But it's not happening here. It's happening in Honduras. And, uh, Tim, what does this speak to you as far as Ron Paul's influence? Uh, do you think that Ron Paul has helped to influence and shape events like this? Well, it certainly does look like it. I mean, they're certainly shaping this whole model on, you know, kind of Ron Paul ideology. 
Yeah, I mean, even Texas state law. What do you think, Dan? You're muted. I I think it sounds great. I mean, we've always, the idea of states' rights is to have these laboratories of experiment, but unfortunately, the states are often just as statist as the federal government. But my one worry would be, it sounds like a great idea, but I'm just wondering, what is, do you, do you know what the monetary system of this, of this place yes, is going to be? I don't know, and it didn't get into detail. The other thing that I think about, though, when thinking about a private city in Honduras, do you guys remember the private police force up in Hardin, Montana, that, that came about? Do you guys remember that? It was about a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago, where Hardin, Montana could not afford its own peace police force anymore, so it privatized itself. And it privatized itself to an international bunch of mercs, mercenaries, and were doing things to usurp the Constitution. I just wonder, because of the nature of it being private, um, I just wonder how that comes into play. You That's know what I mean? Point. Because is the infrastructure going to be private, mm -hmm. owned by a corporation? I mean, I don't know. It, it just seems like there would be – I have a lot of questions. But the reason why I brought this up is because the government of Honduras is willing to go ahead and see the feasibility and how successful a true free market can be. So keep your eyes peeled on Honduras. And I have to say that this probably would not have come about had Ron Paul – not done what he's done over the last 30 years. So it begs the question then, well, this actually leads to an answer. This shows you why, why the powers that be, the establishment, would want to derail a Ron Paul campaign. Because if you have a setup like this, then all of a sudden the reliance on the Federal Reserve and the IMF and the banksters goes down the tubes. So it's very interesting to see. Now, Jesse Benton, of course, campaign manager for Ron Paul and uh, Business Insider wrote why Ron Paul's campaign manager is now taking a job with the GOP establishment. Now, I remember when I heard this. And by that time, we've we had heard of a bunch of other shenanigans going on within the campaign, and I already kind of knew where this is going. But I'll tell you what, guys, I was floored when I heard he was taking over McConnell's campaign. I mean, what do you think, Dan? Well, yeah, I mean, McConnell is kind of a pretty egregious guy to go to. I mean, if he took someone who was, you know, pretty conservative, you know, had some neoconservative tendencies, a little bit too social conservative, someone maybe like, um, uh, you know, maybe even Rick, someone like Rick Santorum. I mean, we wouldn't like that. But we wouldn't, you know, be like, what? But with Mitch McConnell, who's pretty much the representation, the human representation of the Republican establishment, it just seems completely inconsistent with any values of liberty that Benton would supposedly have held. Exactly right. Let me play a clip real quick of Mitch McConnell. And, and this is from 2008 when uh, QE1 was being discussed. Everybody remembers $787 billion. Well, this is Mitch McConnell speaking to that. You may recall I said yesterday that the, uh, the Congress would address the issue of the rescue plan and do it this week. And the Senate will do it tonight. I'm optimistic that we're going to have a, a significant <clears throat> bipartisan uh, victory on the rescue plan here in the Senate tonight. I think it's important to remember this is about Main Street. And not Wall Street. Let's stop right there. This is about Main Street, not Wall Street. Timmy. Oh, God. Timmy, go for it, Timmy. Yeah, right. <laughs> when the <laughs> hell has it ever laugh. been about Main Street? My gosh. How's that? Hey, how's that working out for us? What do you think, Dan? That is just so Republican establishment. It's just, that is just like the epitome of of you know just political game playing just you know the, it was it was they, they just managed to just freak out everyone to get them to support this piece of legislation that when you really look at it did nothing really to help you know the economy 
maybe it's it's you know it's given us a little high in the economy but it's just like when the federal reserve pumps money into us it's like a shot of heroin you know as long as the drugs in your bloodstream yeah you you feel all right but then as soon as it goes away you crash well ben and- swan ben swan did a uh, did a uh, little reality check piece on the qe3 where he went into uh, the specifics of what happened during QE1 and QE2. And QE1, when uh, you, you remember all the credit markets were frozen, oh, God, and we got we to gotta stop, stop the frozen credit markets because if we don't, then nobody's going to borrow and the, the economy's never going to recover. Well, the bank's got the money. The only problem is the bank still got the money. We never got the money. Folks, we'll be right back after these messages. Last segment of hour number one coming up. So much more to discuss in this conspiracy against Ron Paul. You're listening to The Conspiracy Chronicles on the Orion Talk Radio Network. Day started off right with Morning Brew, hosted by Gwen Caldwell and Neil Bigelow. Up-to-date news and information, plus some of the best guests you'll hear on Midday Radio. Check out Morning Brew with Gwen Caldwell and Neil. Weekdays at 12 noon right here on the Orion Talk Radio Network. Joe Joseph along with Tim Watts and our special guest, Dan, Educatorium Euphorium on YouTube. We're talking about the conspiracy against Ron Paul. And, of course, we know that Jesse Benton played a key role in the decimation of his campaign. And now we come to find out that he's jumped ship. And uh, Business Insider's writing, Senate Maj- Minority Leader Mitch McConnell announced today that Jesse Benton, the grassroots political operative who ran Ron Paul's presidential campaign, is leaving Paul World at the end of this year to run McConnell's 2014 re-election campaign. The hire is already being heralded as a shrewd move by McConnell, <clears throat> and, well, that's putting it nicely. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> who appears to have seen the writing on the wall after Paul's son Rand rode the Tea Party wave to defeat the McConnell-backed establishment candidate in the 2010 Senate primary. Benton, who ran Senate, uh, Senator Paul's 2010 campaign, is married to one of Ron Paul's granddaughters and is consummate, a consummate Paul insider with deep ties to the Kentucky Tea Party and... Um, his presence on McConnell's staff virtually guarantees that the Senate Minority Leader won't face a challenge from the right in 2014 or a challenge to his leadership in the Senate should the Tea Party's influence there continue to grow. But Benton is also a controversial figure in the Paul universe, where the management of the Paul campaign is a topic of endless debate. His decision to take a deep a job deep within the heart of the GOP is likely to raise some er, ire, of uh, some of Paul's most active supporters, confirming long-held suspicions that the te- Texas congressman's campaign aide sold him out to the RNC. But Benton doesn't see it that way. Uh, doesn't see it that way. In his first interview since taking the job with McConnell, Benton told in, uh, Business Insider why he decided to take the job with McConnell and why he doesn't think he's selling out at all. So the um, the question is, uh, this is to uh, Jesse Benton, of course is uh, Senator McConnell isn't up for re-election for another two years, and he doesn't have a Democratic opponent. Why take this position now? Do you anticipate a primary challenge? And Jesse Benton responds, no, we're not anticipating a primary challenge, but we expect him to be the biggest target for the National Democrats. It's sort of becoming a rite of passage that the Senate leadership become a huge target. We saw it with former South Dakota Senator Tom Daschle, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, and so on and so forth. We think that Senator McConnell is going to have a big target on his back. But we're going to be ready. We're going to run a heck of a campaign. I mean, just listen to that. It's just, how do you team up with filth? I mean, that guy's dirty. He's real dirty. And what that does, off the bat to me, Dan, it speaks volumes about this guy's character. So what do you think about his character? Oh, oh, definitely. It seems Jesse Benton... Some people seem to think that Jesse Benton is some kind of like sinister force in the campaign, you know, kind of he, he's like the mastermind of this kind of hijacking of Paul's campaign. From after after I've done all this research, it seems to me he's kind of a tool, but the the the, the people who are using him, they are these kind of Republican establishment people who support all these civil liberties violations, who support, you know, economic enslavement essentially. And if I may, I'd just like to confirm your opinion that he has some pretty reprehensible positions. I have a couple of facts here, if I may oh share. Oh, boy. Them. Please. He uh, voted yes on No Child Left Behind, yes mm-hmm. on Medicare Part D. 
He voted yes on increasing penalties for drug offenses. He voted yes on $17.9 billion to the IMF. He voted yes for the Patriot Act and its reauthorizations in 2006 and 2011. He voted yes for the Iraq War, yes for the NDAA, yes for the overriding the presidential veto of the Farm Bill in 2008. And he has voted with the Republican Party 94.04% of the time. Okay, so with that said, now you, you just heard Dan lay it out for you, right? So let me ask you the critical question that Business Insider asked uh, Jesse Benton, and that was, so if you had the chance to address the Ron Paul universe, how would you address any criticism that you have sold out Ron Paul to take a position with the GOP establishment? And here we go. <clears throat> First of all, I absolutely love all of Dr. Paul's supporters. <clears throat> Yes, right, whatever. I admire every single one of them from the different things for the different things they bring to the table. Right, oh, we'll play some sound clips debunking that one. My position is a bit different. I believe that everyone should pursue their passions and be where they can uh, best make a difference. Where I believe I can make a difference is to help bring the voice of the liberty movement and the voice of the Tea Party into a governing coalition. Making compromise, something that Ron Paul spoke out adamantly against. Some people want to work outside the system. Some people want to be 100% rigid. I view what I want to do is try to work with people who want to take our ideas seriously. I want to try to get as many of our ideas as I can get included into the solution. Mm hmm. So, uh, you know, here's the thing. This is what you call selling out. That's what it is. Compromise. When you compromise something, what is compromise? Okay, ready, Dan. The hull of the ship is compromised. Is that a good or a bad thing? Mm, if you're a competing shipping company, it's a good thing. But if you're the people <laughs> on the ship, it's a bad thing. <laughs> it's a very bad thing. That's right. Very good. <laughs> very good. But but you know something? It, 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 it's absolutely right. You know, if you're the people on the ship, Oh, boy, that's not good. But if you're the USS McConnell and the USS Paul has just been compromised, well, this is a fantastic thing. So basically what he's doing is he's saying, well, let me just get in there. I know that if I can get in there, I can change them. You know, ask the average woman out there that has ever gone uh, in a relationship and said, oh, but I can change him. See how that worked out for him and what the percentage of success versus the percentage of failure is. I mean, this is just, this is total bunk. And to me, this seems more along the lines of somebody just trying to make a name for themselves than anything else. But what's even more perplexing is the fact that this guy is married to Ron Paul's granddaughter. Well, you know, you know what? I, I question how long that's going to last. Seriously. You're absolutely right, Tim. But why? Why the fear? You know, yeah. what? 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 What do you think about what? What gives you that impulse? Oh, you know, I don't know. It's just you know, dirty politics. You know, and Ron Paul is a guy again that the Federal Reserve does not want around. You know, I think that one issue alone. We were talking during the break. That one issue is worth trillions of dollars. Good enough reason to keep some guy out of the presidency. A guy that wants to do away with that kind of cartel. You know, and think of the money that they've got at their disposal to just throw away to get rid of the guy. It's just not altogether, not out of the realm of feasibility that someone might marry into the family to maybe uh, circumvent the campaign. I, you know, just saying. Right. And, and not only trillions of dollars, you know, in the money the Fed creates, the power of war and peace, national security issues. Federal Reserve has much more than trillions of dollars at stake here. And also, I don't think Tim's the only one who really has this sentiment. I mean, if you look at the, the diehard, you know, Ron Paul blogger websites where all the people post, a lot of people have been saying the same thing, that they don't think this marriage will last very much longer. How? Uh, oh, man. I mean, you want to talk about a downer for the Paul family. Gee whiz. But, of course, you know, um, there's a lot of information out there that points out that, again, you know, one of the things that Jesse Benton had said was, oh, well, yes, I love all the Ron Paul supporters very much for their the diversity of opinions and everything else. Okay, let's listen to this. 
Did you hear that? Uh, kind of hard to hear, but that was Peter Schiff talking about um, uh, the whole Jesse Benton trying to make the convention seem like a fringe element event. What's your thoughts on that, Dan? Yeah, that was actually a quite a moment of candidness, and Peter Schiff has been a longtime Ron Paul supporter. I'm kind of disappointed because even though he's been a great voice for you know Austrian economics, he he has made that compromise and said he will support Romney because you know he's better than Obama. But that is you know that's amazing, and it, it kind of proves that Benton is being dishonest. And besides you know those exact words from Benton, that text where he sent it to Schiff saying you know there are bad people with this Paul fest, very fringe. You want to stay away from this. He also I mean his actions and the action of his campaign. They've, they've always maneuvered towards the Republicans. They've tried to, you know, kind of steer clear of the grassroots, but they've, they've wanted to have the mainstream people on their side. They've, always, they've wanted to try to, you know, go for the oatmeal, you know, rather than something that's more the, the real diehard Ron Paul supporters. Right. Exactly right. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Now, folks, coming up in hour number two, um, we're going to talk about we're, we're going to get Tom Woods thoughts on this is I have a blog post for him I'm going to go over and also some um, some audio from Tom Woods everybody knows Dr. Tom Woods uh, big Ron Paul supporter there and then we're going to get into Trig V. Olson because uh, a lot of the things that Jesse Benton has done couldn't have been done without Trig V. Olson and so Dan's done a lot of research into Trig V. Olson and we're going to get his thoughts on what he did and also um, how this may have, um, he provided the nail in the coffin for the Ron Paul campaign. So don't go away, folks. Hour number one is done. Hour number two is on the way. So much more to talk about as the conspiracy. Freedom Links Conspiracy Chronicles is the information nation with Ken. Host Ken Hildebrand takes a hard look at the news that the newsmakers soon learn to regret. Ken calls them the way he sees them, and sometimes it isn't pretty. So make sure you tune into the information nation immediately following the Freedom Links Conspiracy Chronicles here on the Orion Talk Radio Network. Joe Joseph, along with Tim Watts, our special guest tonight is Dan, whose YouTube channel is Educatorium Euphorium. And, uh, Judging by what you heard the first hour, I'm sure uh, you guys uh, out in Radio Land are very impressed, as as well as I. Um, that he's done a lot of research into the conspiracy against Ron Paul, and I want to get right back into it. Of course, we're talking about Jesse Benton right now. Tom Woods actually um, slammed him pretty good here on his website, uh, TomWoods.com, on the 13th of September. He writes, my memories of Jesse Benton. Now, this is very important. I want people to hear this. Ron Paul's campaign chair, Jesse Benton, is going to head up the campaign of Mitch McConnell. Gee, now why didn't those incorrigible naysayers have so many unkind words for him? Uh, people who said Benton was positioning himself all along for bigger things in the GOP were scoffed at. Why, Jesse has a secret plan to get Ron Paul the nomination at the last minute? Well, now... We know the real secret plan. Ask yourself this. How much money would you have to be paid to work for an enemy of the things you're supposed to stand for? Maybe now people will understand why Jesse would fly into a tirade after some of Ron's most heroic moments when the rest of us were cheering. I could go through a lengthy catalog of problems with Benton. The grassroots folks already know a lot of them, so there's probably no need. What's done is done. Not that the world revolves around me, but just a word about how I was treated. Early on in the campaign, I posted a note that under the circumstances I thought was astonishingly re restrained. I said that 
if the fundraising success of 2008 was to be surpassed, the grassroots would have to be persuaded that professionals would be brought on this time, that debate coaching would take place as it's done in all other campaigns. Nothing could have been more obvious than that. And this was obviously the note of a friend, not an enemy. Now, here's how, an unprof- here's how a professional would have handled a situation like this in which a longtime supporter is unhappy, but obviously still on the team in the broad sense. X, we understand your sentiments, which are shared by practically everyone, and will ensure that these changes are made. Your input is always welcome, etc. Jesse, on the other hand, denounced me in a series of emails and made pretty clear that I was being cut off from everything, the campaign, campaign for liberty, etc. He referred to my boorish behavior, and he goes in parentheses, he says, you know me, always the bore, and told me from now on to leave him and his family alone. Nice touch, the last part, implying that I was likely to stalk his wife. Naively, I assumed another top person, who I will not name, would be as appalled at Jesse's behavior towards a longtime supporter as I was. So I gleefully forwarded the correspondence to him, only to be told that Jesse's conduct was not unprofessional at all. But I would not technically be banned from C4L, I was told. So I just went ahead and made a whole bunch of videos viewed by hundreds of thousands of people and wrote a whole bunch of articles, here's my favorite, on my own during the campaign in defense of Ron against critics. I was not earning five-figure monthly salary for this. I then went ahead and signed with, on with Revolution Pack. I resigned from it in March of this year because I had said from the beginning that I would only be on board through Super Tuesday, although it was a very busy time in my life and I felt I couldn't contribute enough. The excuse for my absolute exclusion from everything put forth by the official yes man is that my involvement in the pack erected a legal obstacle to any involvement in the campaign. The particular lie has the, the sequence of events reversed. I joined the pack only after I had been blacklisted, but I kept my mouth shut during the campaign every time I saw people. And when they said, Woods isn't allowed to work with the campaign because of the pack," I never corrected anyone. I kept the real story secret for Ron's sake. Uh, no one on earth can fail to understand why I might want to tell it now, to set the record straight. And no one, and no, I looking to, wasn't looking to be hired so I could get that five-figure monthly salary. I was prepared to work for free. Another potential excuse would be that, the radical, that as a radical libertarian, I wouldn't know how to pitch Ron to a GOP audience. This is as wrong as as wrong can be. I have the converts to prove it. As a former mainstream GOPer myself, I know exactly how to frame the argument to win them over. For months and months, the top two people spun everything I did in the most negative light possible in order to poison my reputation with people I respect. They don't know I know this, but I'm happy to say I have friends everywhere and they're loyal. Again, I kept my mouth shut. And again, no one on earth can seriously expect me to continue doing so. Of the various lies Jesse told about me, the least damaging was that claim that I had called him a, well, it's a word I would never say. The actual story was in 2010, I was having drinks with Iowa Rip, uh, Ron Paul GOP people, and Jesse was there. I mentioned the name of an old college friend of mine, and I thought that I thought Jesse might know. And Jesse shouted out, with an important Christian right Ron Paul guy right there, uh, X, my college friend, is a blank sucker. Classy, I reminded Jesse of this incident when he complained of my allegedly boorish behavior. At that moment, the story began to spread, and I had called Jesse, that I had called Jesse a you-know-what. This particular lie made no sense no special effort to re- I made no special effort to refute. I joked with people that if the grassroots heard that I had called Jesse that name, I'd be a hero. So Benton is gone. But is Bentonism alive and well? Bentonism is the playing down on Ron Paul's most popular and important ideas. The impatience with and purging of people who champion those ideas and, obsessive, and an obsessive eye to GOP respectability. Is that what the liberty movement is? Then count me out. Guys, more evidence of the character of Jesse Benton. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, I think Tom Woods really summed it up well. And 
I mean, later on, I mean, that was that was earlier, I think. Later on, he actually, after the campaign ended and he didn't feel inhibited about talking about Benton, he really unloaded on him um, on Free Talk Live, a radio program. Well, and, yes, he did. Yeah, he said um, he was incompetent. And he was also talking about John Tate, who's the president of Campaign for Liberty, called him incompetent and or sinister, said they had no discernible talents or intelligence, that they were attacking the Paul grassroots. They, that uh, Benton was milking the Ron Paul world for all it was worth. Then he could move on in 2016, and he then he kind of you know finished it up with saying, the most effective way to broadcast to the world that a Rand Paul presidential run is not serious is to hire these bozos. Yeah, and absolutely. So he really, they really had some friction between them, and I don't know if if Woods has some bias here, but it seems like Woods, being a longtime Paul supporter and someone who's really been a defender of Paul throughout his, you know, his last couple campaigns, it, it wouldn't seem like he has a real, you know, vendetta or a reason to tell lies about Benton. So Exactly right. There's no personal gain to be had by, by doing so. Let me play a clip real quick of Tom Wood slamming uh, Jesse Benton on Liberty Chat. Here we go. Let's see. What do you think of the mismanagement of the Ron Paul campaign by Jesse Benton? And why weren't you more involved this time around? Um, I'm sure you'll understand this. Is, you know, I don't want to hurt uh, Ron by talking about this. Um, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't have hired this guy. and I would, He wouldn't be a million miles uh, close to anything I was involved in. But, uh, but that's as much as I'll say right now. And I wasn't involved. I made one, I thought, exceedingly mild criticism early on back in May on my blog. I said, you know, if you want to raise money, you're, you're just going to have to assure the people that this time we're going to have a professional team. We won't be embarrassed by the ads. And we'll have some debate coaching like all other campaigns have. And man, my head was ripped off. And not by Ron himself, of course, who perfectly well concedes the problems last time. But uh, my head was ripped off. And so I, I just knew, well, obviously, I, there's no way they're going to take any advice from me. They're not going to listen to me. Uh, they're not, I'm not going to be allowed to take part in it. So I thought, well, all right, well, whatever, I'll, I'll just make videos. And I made videos that had hundreds of thousands of views where there's no way they can stop me from talking directly to him through these videos. And I couldn't talk to him on the phone because of the PAC situation. But uh, I, I did what I could, and it would have been nice to be more involved. But that was the decision that, uh, that Jesse Benton and John Tate decided to make. Well, and... <laughs> And therein lies the problem, folks. The real people dedicated to the liberty principles, the principles of liberty and freedom. Dr. Tom Woods being a very outspoken person and advocate for liberty and, and uh, freedom in this country. And he was totally shut out by Jesse Benton and John Tate. Unbelievable, folks. And uh, when we come back, I'm going to play a little clip uh, from Porter Davis of... Uh, Lawyers for Ron Paul, as he talks about some of the problems that he saw. And then we'll get into, uh, there's so much more to talk about. So don't go away, folks. Just a reminder about the Orion Shippen banner. If you like what you hear on Orion Talk Radio, you can help us with a personal donation through our online shipping banner. Look for it on our website on the left under the ad banners. Give it a click and you can help us spread the truth by supporting one of the fastest growing talk radio outlets in the world. We sincerely thank you for helping us get the truth out. Orion News Talk, news and views beyond the mainstream media. Joe Joseph and Tim Watts, our special guest tonight is Dan, Educatorium Euphorium on YouTube. Folks, I suggest you subscribe to his YouTube channel as he's got an array of videos that just show how far ahead of the, the, of the power curve that Dan really is. And it should give you hope. It should give you hope that the younger generation is actually kind of starting to take the bull by the horns. And I mean, I, I say that because they're taking their own education into their own hands. This is about education. The war that we're fighting is about education. It's not about grabbing that AK-47 and storming Washington. It ain't going to work. It's not going to work. You have to educate the people. You know, Thomas Jefferson said it best that tyranny and oppression will vanish like the dark at the dawn of the day when the people are informed generally. 
And we are experiencing that now with a almost an awakening of sorts where our generation is now teaching the younger generation about how it should be in molding their views now so that they don't get coerced and corrupted by inaccurate history books or uh, perhaps some thoughts or personal agendas at the local level or with teacher unions helping to format curriculums. That's why I can't say enough about homeschooling and the importance of taking your child's education into your own hands. Very, very important. And as we, as we uh, continue down the road of the Ron Paul conspiracy, the conspiracy against Ron Paul, I want to play a small one-minute clip from uh, Joyce Riley's show, The Power Hour, on June 18th, 2012. This is with Porter Davis, a lawyer from Lawyers from Ron Paul. Here you go. Porter Davis. Porter Davis has a bachelor's degree, master's degree. He's done everything from own a radio station to be involved in his family food business. But you know what? His business today is freedom and liberty. And we're going to be talking about the Ron Paul campaign and the changes with this announced takeover of the Ron Paul campaign. Porter Davis, thank you so much for joining us in the Power Hour today. Hey, Joyce, how are you? I'm blessed, and I am so glad we have people like you out there that believe that freedom is everything. And if we let go of that, we've lost it all. There's some news, uh, breaking news, that over the weekend, uh, there was a takeover of the Ron Paul campaign, a righteous mutiny, they're calling it. Uh, what do you know about this? Well, I'm actually on the executive committee for the lawyers for Ron Paul, and you know, we have come to the conclusion, which I, I came to back in March, that uh, the, the camp, there are elements inside the campaign that are really not playing to win leadership. Oh, my, my, my. So even the lawyers for Ron Paul, a prestigious organization that supports Ron Paul, noticed back in March that the, the, the power brokers within the Paul campaign weren't playing to win. Well, if you're not playing to win, then what are you doing? What do you think, Dan? Dan? The line was... Oh, can you hear me? I can hear you now. All right. Um, the line was that they were trying to infiltrate the GOP establishment. They were they, Essentially, the campaign wasn't as much about winning for Ron Paul as it was taking over the Republican Party and instilling in it the ideals of liberty that Ron Paul has represented all these years. And actually, there was a great interview done by Adam Kokesh, who I'm sure you guys all know. He's a great fighter for liberty out there. And he did it with a woman named Penny Langford Freeman, I believe. She mm. was Ron Paul's political director from 1998 to 2007. And she gave a lot of valuable information about uh, Trig V. Olson and Jesse Benton. But she made the point of saying part of the reason she left in 2007 was because the the bureaucracy of Ron Paul's campaign, they were making it clear that they weren't going to fight it to win. They were going to fight it to try to influence the Republican Party. And she said, you know, I'm not working for this campaign to influence the Republican Party. I'm working for this campaign to win. And that drove her out, someone who'd been with Ron Paul for, you know, nine years, who'd been pretty high up in the Ron Paul organization. So, I mean, I guess that's kind of telling about the priorities of the campaign. Absolutely. And we, we heard the reaction of Tom Woods talking about the same thing, you know. Here I am just trying to give some constructive criticism. I get blast, blasted for it and eventually just ostracized because they don't want to win. That wasn't their goal. It's amazing um, how that's – now, now to their, in their defense, let me play both sides of the fence, okay? In their defense, a lot of the Republican Party platform was Ron Paul-esque. I mean, they definitely made a mark, but the question that I have – and I'm going to pose to you, Timmy, is what's the platform worth if they don't follow it? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I want to know how long it's going to last, too. You know, is, is it just for this election, this cycle, you know, to, to, to kind of pull those libertarians away? We'll see what happens the next cycle around, you know. I would it's, hope that exactly I would hope they do. Well, I'd hope that the libertarians and the independents out there would see through the smokescreen and at the very least just just vote third party. Mm hmm. You know, it, it doesn't even – at this point in time, I, I would be willing um, – and I would never vote for a Democrat or Republican anyway unless – Absolutely not. Unless, well, unless, of course, it's Ron Paul. But 
Um, so, or somebody more, you know, liberty-minded like Ron Paul. But what I'm coming to find out is that the majority of them that hold true to the ideals of liberty and freedom typically don't run within the two major parties. They just don't. Be- because of an, it's the honor thing, right, Tim? I mean, uh-huh. don't, you, don't you concede um, part of the idealism and the values of what somebody who's principled actually is if you do that? I, I don't know if I misunderstood your statement at, at the beginning because, you know, maybe not in every election where you've got people of principle running, but I thought 2008 was, that was the one for the books. because Very you had telling. Ron Paul running for the uh, the Republicans. You had Dennis Kucinich running for the uh, the Democrats. Two people who are both very good friends across the aisle, very close. More people, uh, most people don't know how close they are, but they are very close friends. And both of them, as you followed the polls that year in 2008 again, they were both hands down the choice of their party. So they, they were out there running. Their party just did not let them run. They did not let them ascend to the top. They were clearly the choice, but that's not what was reported by the media. And, you know, the, I'm sorry that, to say that the parties did not follow the, the lead of, uh, you know, the, the people with, you know, the, the, the support the party. Right, absolutely. So, so Dan, how does Trick V. Olson play into all this? We got about a minute and a half before the break. Right, and um, I, I can't really explain all that he's done in a minute and a half, but basically most of the information came from an inter- the interview I mentioned earlier with Penny Langford Freeman. Yes. She has a lot of insider information in the campaign, and basically the quick summary of Trig V. Olson would be he was sent by Mitch McConnell and the Republican National Senatorial campaign, I believe, to kind of be the adult in the room, that's their words, for Rand Paul after he won, and he was quite the upstart. So he he really had quite an influence on the Paul campaign after that, and both Rand and Ron Paul's campaigns. Unbelievable. And, and, and isn't it interesting that the Pauls have been through this countless times? Maybe not Rand so much, but here's Rand. He puts a whooping to uh, Mitch McConnell's 2010 uh, Senate candidate to replace Jim Bunning in Kentucky. I mean, just totally thrashes him. And so what does he do? Well, we got to keep an eye on that Ron, uh, Rand Paul fella, you know? And eventually it looks like – it looks like – and to me, I, you know, right off the bat I said to myself, boy, just judging by the way Rand Paul talks and some of his viewpoints, he's got like a neoconish streak in him. I've always thought that from day one. And the fact that he talks like a Catholic priest. So, I mean, those two things kind of together, I was like, ooh, he's not like his daddy. And as it turns out, he's, he's not like his daddy. We were absolutely right. When we come back, we'll talk more about Trigby Olson and how Trigby played a integral role in the decimation of the Ron Paul. Folks, don't forget to check out our social media pages such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. You can like us, tweet us, and watch us all by clicking the links under our social media section on the website. The biggest fear that the global gangsters have is the truth, so help us spread it far and wide. Linking to us through our social media pages. Thanks for helping making Orion Talk Radio one of the fastest growing talk radio outlets. Joe Joseph here along with Tim Watts. Our special guest is Dan Educatorium Euphorium on YouTube. And by the way, folks, not even a legal voting age yet. Mm -mm -mm. Yet has a sound opinion. And and tell you what, spot on on all all these topics. So we're talking about Trig V. Olson, Dan. Give us the lowdown on Trig V. Olson and how Trig V. played a part in derailing the campaign. Mute. Absolutely. Very good. Okay, there you go. See, yeah, it's the mute button. All right, I'm sorry. I forgot to press that. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> so this is actually a story that I found extremely interesting. This is from Penny Langford Freeman, who, like I said before, was Ron Paul's political director from 1998 to 2007. And basically what happened was tr- uh, after Rand won the campaign in Kentucky, after he was nominated by the Republican Party as their candidate, the you know the Republican establishment, especially in the Senate, was starting to get kind of worried. They 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 saw this fiery young and son of Ron Paul, so I mean that obviously scared them quite a bit. And Mitch McConnell and the Republican National Senatorial Campaign sent this man named Trig V. Olson uh, to to be the adult in the room for the Rand campaign. 
Yeah. And this Trig V. Olsen, he's had quite, he has quite a resume, to be perfectly honest. Let me see if I can get this up here. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, if I, I'm, it's, it's amazing. He's the, he was the president of Viking Strategies LLC, founder of AdvancingFreedom.org, managing director of Mercury Public Affairs, independent consultant and self-employed author, e-political director at John McCain 2008. He's the country director of the International Republican Institute, a founding partner of public issue management, a campaign oh. manager, and a director of constituent relations at the office of lieutenant governor of Minnesota, I believe. So this guy has got a lot of cred. The thing is, is that his cred doesn't really line up with Paul's ideology, particularly with his work at the International Republican Institute. The International Republican Institute is, from their website, quote, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. Uh, the inter- the uh, International Republican Institute advances freedom and democracy worldwide by developing political parties, civic institutions, open elections, democratic governance, and the rule of law, unquote. This organization was involved in the color revolutions of, of the Bush era, the Bush one era in Eastern Europe, and it, it's part of the National Endowment for the Democracy. It was, uh, it was developed in the Reagan administration. It's called part of the freedom industry, and it's done – actually looking at, its, looking at what the International Republican Institute has done, it's actually done a good deal of good in creating a more liberal you know, political environment. But it's also done some kind of sketchy stuff, and it's extremely closely tied to the Republican Party and its corporate interests. Uh, can I give a couple examples? By all means, Dan. The floor is yours. Okay. So um, it was – they, they were linked to the undermining the State Department interest and overthrowing the Haitian – a democratically elected leader, Jean Bertrand Aristide. And they were also caught, uh, I, I believe they were, they, were, uh, using, they were using the International Republican Institute to basically you know, funnel tax money to groups that were opposed to Hugo Chavez. Oh, that's a uh, surprise. Well, yeah, I mean, it, very, it has some cl- close uh, ties to the Bush administration. Uh, <laughs> actively supported the war on terror, and it's been accused of skewing polling data to support Bush administration, particularly in polls of Afghanistan and Iraqi peoples, because they've done a lot of polling work in foreign countries as well. Um, and uh, so basically, this is, this is a Republican Party institution, very, has some very neoconservative tendencies. John McCain was the chairman since 1993. He's been, he's been the chairman. So obviously he's, he's been very deep into this whole Republican Party establishment stuff. Oh, right. Plus you've got an established war hawk heading it. Oh, definitely. And I mean he was actually the e-political director at John McCain 2008. He, quote, reported directly to the campaign manager with responsibility for serving as the principal liaison between the campaign's online efforts and the campaign's other divisions. So this guy has a lot of cred with mainstream Republican kind of ideology, neoconservative regime change kind of freedom industry stuff. And while doubtlessly that's impressive, it just doesn't seem like something that really fits with Ron Paul's ideology of, you know, staying out of other countries' business, of avoiding corporate interests and entangling alliances. And Am I allowed to go on or am I taking up too much time? No, go ahead. No, 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 no. Like I said, the floor is yours, Dan. Okay, so after – so this is this is Trig V. Olson. This is who he is. So obviously he's he's very well known within the Republican loop, Republican establishment. He's sent by Mitch McConnell and the Republican National Senatorial Campaign to uh, the Rand campaign. And he ended up pimping Benton quite a bit. He he really pushed him up. He he suggested that he got promotions. He was really kind of – instrumental in you know pushing benton up through the ranks of the campaign he was already he already had quite a bit of influence but he was i think i think olsen um, olsen really put him through the roof and um he he really blew up jesse benton's credit for rand's victory over the republican establishment in kentucky even though a different campaign manager had led them through that this this guy had led them through this whole grueling campaign and then they fired him and put Jesse Benton in the place. So it, it's basically this Trig V. Olson guy has been really pushing Benton up in the campaign and eventually in Paul's campaign. And Langford um, Freeman reported that a man who was been in the campaign meetings told her that in the Ron Paul meetings that Trig V. Olson would always sit by Jesse Benton, whispered in his ear, and then Jesse Benton would say something you know he didn't come up with. So basically, this guy has been really a force behind Jesse Benton's, you know, 
uh, rise in the Paul campaigns. Which which leads to, yeah, which which confirms, Timmy, our uh, our thought that Jesse Benton's just a mere puppet in all this. Yeah. I mean, that yes. that really kind of confirms it. And you know what else? You know, as I said earlier, it, it kind of in our off air conversation. It really wouldn't also surprise me to see uh, Jesse Benton floating somewhere someday soon. Boy, that's the truth. You, you think about um, the the stuff that he probably knows. Oh, yeah, like your next Vince Foster. Yeah, that's a, oh, gosh, a subject for another Conspiracy Chronicles. Oh, gosh. Anyway, folks, I mean, this is, again, this is something that, that you know, a lot of people will blame Ron Paul as being this... Uh, uh, this Freemason set to de- derail uh, the the whole liberty movement and everything else. I don't think so. I think the poor man is seventy seven years old. I really think his his heart was half, was half into it when uh, he ran this time. And the only reason I think he ran was just because of the outpouring of support and and all the calls for him to run. Uh, that was that was the whole reason why he ran. I'll bet you. If it was just left up to him and all that kind of stuff was just pushed off to the side and he had to decide whether he was going to stay with Mrs. Paul and kind of just, you know, go out peacefully or actually do this run, I almost think that he wouldn't have he wouldn't have run. It was just there were that many people calling for him to run. Me would be me, one of them, me, one of them. As a matter of fact, if 2016 came around, I don't care how old he is. (laughs) He's still the best hope that we've got. So far. And um, and they know that. But, of course, the other thing to think about, too, is all things aside, the guy has run successful campaign after sex- successful campaign, even if for local Texas politics, you know, in the House of Representatives. But he's got to be plugged in a little more to his campaign than to just let Jesse Benton uh, run amok. You know, and, and, and to have an operative, Tim, I mean, yeah. to know that you have an operative in your ranks. I mean, what does that say? Yeah. You know, as we've been talking here about the ideology and everything that Ron Paul stands for and, and what he's done, you know, it, it it just became apparent to me, you know, why? You know, because we were always worried, you know, during the campaign, gosh, you know, I hope he doesn't get on a small plane, you know, or, or something like that, you know. Yeah, a little two-seater. They, yeah, where they take you out. But when you think about it, and back to the things we've been talking about here, that's the worst thing of all worlds for these guys is to take someone like him out because for crying out loud, he becomes legend at that point. You know, and his ideology hopefully continues onward. So maybe there was a lot of deep thinking there about, all right, let's just get someone inside the campaign rather than take this guy out. We'll circumvent the thing from within inside. And I don't know, a lot of merit to thinking about not really off on the guy just you know, kind of you, from the well, inside. If you look back through history, Tim, Mm. You know, martyrdom is a very, very, very powerful thing. Oh, it, yeah, exactly. It comes back to bite them. They learned that from JFK and from MLK. And I, I, I right. shouldn't use their initials. I hate that when they do. Ask, ask, ask the Persians how the, the Spartans worked out for them. <laughs> you know? <Yeah. laughs> this, this, this isn't just in American history, folks. This goes back thousands and thousands of years. And they know history. They do know history. And they know the effectiveness of what martyrdom what martyrdom does. Yep. Yep. Folks, don't forget immediately following the Freedom Link here on the Orion Talk Radio Network. It's the Information Nation with Ken. So don't forget to stay tuned as he's gonna give you the latest headlines only the way Ken can give it. And boy, I'll tell you what, two hours certainly goes by fast when you talk about things like this, when you talk about the conspiracy against Ron Paul, and you get into the facets with a very, very bright and intelligent young man like Dan, Educatorium before him on YouTube. So Dan, uh, before, you know, I'd like to thank you for coming on the broadcast, and we're definitely going to have you on again. Is there anything else you want to talk about before we, uh, before we uh, ride off into the sunset, shall we say? I, I kind of want to talk about you. Had, you had, can you hear me? Yeah, just fine. Yeah, um, I kind of want to talk about Ron Paul's legacy because, I mean, you you were talking about how like legacy is a really important thing. Very. And so, I mean, even if they can take over his campaign, I mean, his legacy will still live on. So it almost seems like in a way they've tried to take over his legacy a bit too 
especially in his congressional district, because this is he's Ron Paul has said this is his last run for Congress in his district. So he's endorsed Ted Cruz, who's running for his seat in Congress. But Ted Cruz has kind of neoconservative streak in there. And actually, Penny Langford Freeman had speculated that even um, uh, Jesse Benton was possibly selling endorsements, that this wasn't actually coming from Paul. This was coming from his organization. And she pointed out that um, if, if Ted Cruz could use Ron Paul's fundraising list, because he has a huge fundraising list from all these people who have supported him, right? If he could use the fundraising list that he has, uh, and he, and if if they got a little bit, the Ron Paul campaign got a little bit off the top from that, from from the um, from the money they got from that list, that could be a pretty lucrative deal. So I mean, I don't know if that's true. Again, that's coming from someone who's been inside the Ron Paul campaign, and I can't say because I'm not in there whether or not it is true. But it seems like they've been trying to even take over Ron Paul's legacy in the way that they've been trying to put in his place someone who's much more in line with their values and they've even gotten his campaign at least to endorse them so it's kind of you know a um what would it be it would be like a you know it it really kind of hurts it's like it's it's almost ironic but in a really sad kind of way yeah no uh, no doubt and the, the issue that I have again is where's Ron Paul in all this you know, when, it, when these questions arise, how come he's not there to squash it? You know what I mean? We're, we're, why isn't he speaking out about this, about his campaign manager going over to Mitch McConnell's campaign? Well, And, and I often think about uh, Ron Paul's response to 9-11. Because you know the guy knows that, it, that there was something fishy about 9-11. You know that, that, that the official account, it didn't happen the way that way. And he knows it. So here he is, right? He's going off. He's riding off into the sunset. His legacy, he's pretty much, his legacy's set. Here's Mr. Consistent, right? You have 9-11. Why not go out with a bang and say, hey, guys, you know what? I really think that there needs to be a new investigation into 9-11. But the times that he's talked about it, he's always been very standoffish about that subject. Almost like it's taboo. Don't talk about that. And I just wonder... If that isn't uh, a, maybe an indication that he just doesn't like dealing with controversial stuff like this, I don't know. What's your thoughts, Tim? I think it's going to be interesting to see when he leaves Congress. Maybe if he doesn't feel like he's shackled down to anything anymore and he doesn't have to uh, be beholden to the vote and worry about whether he's going to make re-election for saying something controversial, I'd be really interested to see. Now, if he mums up after he leaves... You know, that'll be something kind of interesting to take note of. But I'm kind of hoping that he might might speak up a little more. Yes, I'm disappointed he hasn't spoken out more to this point. He, he used to. I think he kind of got bitch slapped with that stuff for a while. Well, and look at what happened to trafficking. Exactly. And, you know, and walking the track with Jim Trafficking. Walking the track with Jim Trafficking. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> could I say something about this? Go, Go ahead, ahead, Dan. Yeah, I really like on this particular issue of 9-11, I really haven't done enough research to have an opinion on whether it was all legit or not. I've heard some stuff, but I really can't form an opinion on that. And so I think one story you brought up or, uh, over break where you said that there was someone arrested for writing out something that could be seen as you know challenging the government's – what the government said on 9-11. I don't think that's an issue as much of um, the, the 9-11 issue itself. As there's an issue of free speech, right? I mean, well, that's, well, let me let me bring that up since since you brought that up as our last story of the night, and not to get sidetracked, but this is a very important thing. This is why I wanted to bring this up. Napa Valley Register is talking about sidewalk chalking provokes police. Local woman cites free speech. Uh, Amy Larson readily admits writing 9/11 Truth and 9/11 Truth Now in chalk on First Street sidewalk over Napa Creek. "Quote: I just wanted people to think for themselves," said Larson, 29. I believe we've lost a lot of civil liberties since the 9-11 t- attacks, and I'm really concerned about that. This is real uh, political free speech, added Larson, who says the investigation into the terrorist attacks in New York City and Washington, D.C. should be reopened, which I, I totally agree. Her chalk writing, which occurred September 11th, the 11th anniversary of the terrorist attack, got Larson arrested on suspicion of vandalism. 
a self-described political activist who had never been arrested, Larson said she was returning from the farmer's market after buying fruits and vegetables when she started writing the statements on the sidewalk. A police officer stopped to talk to her, then left, she said. I was never told not to chalk the sidewalk, said Larson, who's married and works in a wine cellar. Five to ten minutes later, the officer returned with her boss in an SUV, Larson said. She was first detained, then arrested for investigation of felony vandalism and booked at the Napa County Jail. According to police, a police report filed in court, a city employee said Larson's chalk writing matched other chalk markings uh, he had been removing all over the town. Larson, who strongly denies having chalked at other locations, spent about 30 hours in custody before being released on her own recognizance. She could have gotten out sooner, but she did not want to spend uh, money for her $10,000 bail. $10,000 bail. For chalk. For on the chalk, yeah, on the sidewalk. Uh, her fellow inmates were nice, she said, adding that they had never met anyone who'd been arrested for chalking. <laughs> I bet they hadn't. Yeah, her husband, husband Adam was pretty shocked, too, she said. Larson still can't believe that she was put behind bars as a vandalist for making a political commentary in chalk. That's, not, that's just not true, she said. Instead of, of a felony, Larson was charged with misdemeanor vandalism on September 13th, according to court documents. A hearing is scheduled for 8.30 on uh, this Wednesday in Napa County Superior Court. Police Captain Jeff Trodley said police had few options but to arrest Larson after she failed to cooperate with officers. She gave her name and that's it, he said. Trodley said the city has reports of 40 other locations with similar graffiti. It doesn't matter whether the messages are written in chalk or spray paint, he said. Graffiti is graffiti. Lee uh, Phillipson, Napa County assistant attorney, said Larson was charged with a misdemeanor because of her lack of a criminal record. It took hundreds of dollars in time and materials by the city to clean it up. Oh, my gosh. It's oh, chalk. Right. Take a hose. Take a hose. Hose, And you can. Oh, geez. Are you it kidding? would not have just washed away. And it was found in several places, according to reports. So they're charging her. And I, this is what it appears, that apparently the mad chalker is out in Napa Valley and is chalking 9-11 um, uh, truth phrases all over the city. And so they finally nabbed this woman who they, they're probably going to try and pin all of these, these horrific acts of vandalism on. Now, and it's chalk. If she was out there, you know, putting down signs, you and I were talking in, during the break, you know, the Federal Reserve is great. Would they have done anything about that? Or, or here's one I just thought of. The Napa Valley Police Department is super. Yeah. You know, they kick, would they, kick would they have had a problem with that? They kick buttocks. Yes, yeah. I could see that right now. Yeah. And, of course, there would be no, no problems with that. But you're right, Dan. This is a, this is a free speech problem. It, it's a free speech problem. But... Um, the, the whole vandalism thing, I could see if it was permanent, but this isn't permanent. This is dust. You're basically writing it in dust. I mean, it doesn't get any more removable than that. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, I think, again, I, I really don't know what to think about 9-11. I, I, I haven't seen the evidence to make the decision whether or not it was legit. But I think the issue that is really pointed out in this article is that Whatever happened, it's in the past, but we can't let them take our liberties right now because of that. I mean, they always say, you know, the Muslim terrorists hate us for our freedoms. So how do we fight that? By taking away more American freedoms? Yeah. Well, it's, what's, it's totally you know, counterintuitive. It's like we're playing into what they want us to do if you really stop and think about it. Absolutely. That's the whole idea. And by the way, Dan, I will, uh, I will leave you with this as um, <clears throat> a couple of questions. Uh, that you can ponder as uh, if you ever decide to get into 9-11. Uh, three, three buildings, two planes, number one. And how do two buildings fall through the path of most resistance into their own footprint? And That's it. Speed. it. You know, if you can answer me those questions on how two buildings defy the law of physics, I'm, I'm your man. Because I, I, I so desperately want to believe that, that there wasn't any... Um, Oh, corrupt efforts within our government to usher in a police state of um, historical proportions. Unfortunately, yep. the evidence seems to point more and more towards the fact that that's the case. And that's, of course, something that Ron Paul has been fighting for for so many years and continues to fight for to this day. And Dan, I'd like to thank you for coming on tonight. You've been a fantastic, fantastic guest. And I certainly hope to have you on again real soon. 
as um, all your research has been extremely insightful and informative. So thanks for coming on tonight. Hey, thank you for having me, Joe. And thank you, Tim, too. You bet. Thanks, Danny. Folks, this is the broadcast for tonight. Don't forget, coming up is the Information Nation with Ken Hildebrand. The next edition of Freedom Link is Tuesday from 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Until then, 